On this episode of The Curbsiders, we will once again be talking with Dr. Joel Toff, or as he's better known on Twitter, at kidney underscore boy. And since I know this is the time of year where we are generally picking up a lot of new listeners, I wanted to let you know that on most shows, we spend the first 10 minutes hanging out kind of for our own wellness, talking about work-life integration, things we're reading, things we're doing for professional development. If that doesn't interest you, then you can skip right ahead. This episode, for the first about 15 minutes after this intro, we will be talking with Joel about a favorite failure of his and a little bit about Twitter. If that doesn't interest you, you can skip right ahead. As always, we have timestamps that go along with the show, so you can always look at those to see where we actually get into the topic. But as Dr. Paul Williams will tell you, we highly recommend you listen to the first 10 to 15 minutes of the show because uh, it makes you a better person. And with that being said, enjoy the show. For entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible to this We should always do your own homework and let us know when we're ready. Welcome back to the Curbsiders. Well, hi, Matt. How are you yeah. doing? <laughs> good. How's life? Uh, life is good. I, we were we were just talking about all the interesting emails and offers we've been getting for the show. <laughs> I love. Please, them. please keep them coming. Uh, we will we will not be reading all of them on air, but uh, please keep them coming. Paul, please some good ones. Is Paul here too? No. Yeah. Yeah. Here. Present. <laughs> Paul, can you uh, can you tell the audience uh, what this show is about? Oh, sure. We we are an internal medicine po- <laughs> no, I'm not so sure. We're an internal medicine podcast that uses expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. So this on this show, uh, let's be honest. I think most of us don't understand renal tubular acidosis, and you probably get yeah, confused sure by the by confused by the super convenient naming system, which we'll talk about, which uh, doesn't really go in the order of the nephron; it goes in the order of discovery, and. Uh, you know, the the inner workings of the kidney uh, are, have always been a bit confusing to me. So that's why we've asked back the salt whisperer, Dr. Joel Toff, to kind of explain this all to us. And if you haven't heard him on the show before, he is, I guess, unanimous, unanimously. He is by far uh, our most requested <laughs> guest. <laughs> I won't try to say words that I can't pronounce, Paul. He is our most requested guest. Dr. Toff is better known by his much cooler alter ego, at kidney underscore boy on Twitter. He started his personal blog, Precious Bodily Fluids, 10 years ago. He is a co-founder of Neff Madness, Neff Journal Club, and the Nephrology Social Media uh, Internship, NSMC. He was recently recognized by the ASN as the 2017 recipient of the Robert G. Narens Award for Innovations in Teaching, and we are thrilled to have him back on the show talking about renal tubular acidosis and non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Wonderful. You know what, Matt? You're in control, so take it away. <laughs> yeah, you've had a streak of passable humor, Stuart. I like it. <laughs> and that's funny because we're talking about urine and it's passable. Let's not push it. Here we are back uh, for another episode with with Kidney Boy, Joel Toff. Joel, thank you for joining us yet again. Happy to be here. I don't I don't know if this is five times yet, but we gotta I, I owe you a smoking jacket, I believe. <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 waiting for it. I actually I would just like the patch. I want a uh uh a uh, cash like memorial patch for my white coat just to confuse everybody around the hospital. <laughs> I've imagined since the first time we talked that if if a kidney could talk, it would sound just like you. <laughs> if a kidney could talk, it would be terrifying. <laughs> well, <laughs> Paul, I'm just waiting. I see the wheels turning there. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm envisioning it sound like someone who's had too much milk to drink. Sort of that very kind of moist Alan Rickman kind of voice. I. I probably put too much thought into this. (laughs) Joel, uh, why don't you give the audience a one-liner to, in case some of them don't know who you are yet. 
So I'm a 48-year-old white male with no significant past medical history except for some uh, subclinical sleep apnea. Don't worry, it's a Malin Patty score one. Uh, I work as a clinical nephrologist at St. John Hospital and Medical Center, and I'm on the faculty there for the nephrology fellowship, for their internal medicine residency, and uh, medical students from a number of uh, medical schools in the area. I do uh, bedside and didactic teaching, and uh, additionally, I uh, have a... Um, a uh, blog called Precious Bodily Fluids, where I've been talking about uh, nephrology education for the last decade. And um, uh, as I like to say, I'm kind of a big deal on Twitter. Where... <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> Which nothing makes you sound stupider than saying you're a big deal on Twitter. <laughs> I think I think since you, you kind of got us all like hooked on Twitter uh, the first time we talked to you, which was probably a year and a half ago or so. And, and since then, we've all been on Twitter right. and definitely have a lot of shared friends on Twitter now, which is We've been, been writing a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. But I feel like I've been writing your t- coattails just as much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So why don't we take a little bit of a, a different, different tack tonight? We, we, we're workshopping this new question, Joel. So what, uh, why don't you share with the audience uh, a favorite failure that you've had and, and sort of what you took away from that? So the one failure that I uh, I can't get past, I wouldn't call it my favorite failure. It's just kind of the the failure that won't that I can't get past. Is a it's a patient that died. I was a, a resident at the University Hospital where I was a resident where I was a resident, and um, uh, most ER traffic went to the county hospital, which was right next door, and the ER in the University Hospital very low traffic only would get an occasional patient that usually already had uh, a relationship with that hospital. This is uh, 1998, and so there's no electronic medical records at all. And this patient comes in with um, pretty significant chest pain radiating to his back, and I'm feeling like this must be a dissection. And I get an EKG, and it's not... Very remarkable, not entirely normal. I don't remember specifically what was, what was there, but there wasn't, there was no major Q waves. There was no major ST, uh, uh, T wave changes. And, um, and the biggest problem was I was all alone and, uh, there was a nurse there, but I got a chest x ray and this is, you know, to see the chest x ray, you have to run to radiology. Like there's no way to get it in the ER and I'm all alone and, just about every minute that I'm there, this patient is getting sicker and sicker. And uh, patient's blood pressure starts falling, and I'm putting it in a central line so I can start the patient on pressors. And um, I remember talking with the, the patient's wife was there, and she's she says, you know, we have an old EKG at home. Do you think that would be helpful? I'm like, oh, my God, I'd love to be able to be able to compare this to an EKG. And like, these are all things that we take for granted now that if right. I want to pull up the x-ray, I can just go to the EMR. If I want to pull up an old admissions note or see an old EKG, it's all on the computer. But in this situation, I would have to wait for medical records to open to get an old chart. So I told the wife to run home and get the EKG. And while I'm handling this and you know I'm doing everything right, I'm getting the lines in, I'm getting the presser started, I momentarily get his blood pressure to improve, and then it goes to respiratory failure, I successfully intubate this patient. And I'm so focused the whole time on doing the next medically important thing. I never call an attending and I never call a fellow. And I work my ass off on this patient for an hour and all he does is get sicker and he ultimately dies. And uh, the, sometimes, you know, you think tactically, what's the next thing I need to do? And you don't stop and you don't think strategically. Right. Like, what do I need to do? What's the real thing that I need? I really need help, right? I can't take this patient to cath, right? I can be a great resident, but I'm never going to, I'm not a cardiology fellow. And uh, we got a post and it ended up being a big posterior MI that killed him. And uh, I don't know if he could have been saved by going for a, by an emergency cath, but he would have had a much better chance mm-hmm. uh, had we done that. And the worst thing was that the wife left to get the EKG. And when she left, he was alert and he was oriented and he was talking to her. And by the time she returned, he was dead. And so I had that decision to send her off for that EKG, which didn't show anything anyways, meant that she didn't get to say goodbye to her husband. That's a 
Yeah. That's one. There's nothing, there's nothing I can do. You know, it's just, it, it kind of reminds me. Of, did you hear that story about, uh, Bawa Garba? Bawa Garba, no. this, uh, this resident. I think she was a resident in pediatrics in Great Britain in the National Health Service and just had been working her ass off and law. I think ended up losing a patient and getting prosecuted for this. And it, when you hear the situation, it was everything, all the circumstances were against her. And she had really done an, an amazing job under the circumstances. But, you know, when people die, uh, it's easy to blame people without really understanding what they were going through. So, yeah, that, I'm not sure if it's my favorite mistake. It's a it's a horrible, it's a horrible mistake. I, I think that is that I fortunately I, I don't have a comparable story, but I, I think it is very easy, especially uh, when you're in residency or early on in your career, anytime where you're just like, I can you, you just like you're like, I can handle this. And you don't you keep trying to handle it yourself without like recognizing, OK, I can just call a rapid response, right. get some more bodies here. And then we get we get more brain power. And you can sort of like get take control of the situation. Or I've had this happen slowly where you're seeing a patient every day on rounds, they're getting a little worse and you don't think to call a consult. So I think it can go, it, you know, that was a very acute situation, but I've seen this play the course over a week where a patient gets sicker before you. And maybe if you had called the right help earlier, you could have, you could have helped them. So. Yeah. I mean, just that's the great thing about our residency system is that there are always people available to help and you just need to remember to ask yeah, yeah. paul do you want to ask any questions before we i was gonna we were going to talk about tutorials but uh if you had anything else you wanted to ask or add no man go to town as long as it's less of a bummer than our last topic i mean <laughs> have at it <laughs> i think it was a very valuable teaching point it was yeah it was, it was a, too. a good story a valuable story yeah well i'm glad that my misery and this tragedy <laughs> that i caused could be a good teaching point for you guys <laughs> Well, I think we've all been there. I'm going to take, we don't have to put this in the show, but I'm just reminded, like, I, I love this question and I've just been thinking about it a lot. I had a patient who was always a little bit sort of personally challenging and then sent me a message that said, every time I eat, I poop. And I, I'm thinking, well, that's, that's how digestion works. Like that's, <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure what you want from me, but he actually, he, he sent the message to his gastroenterologist too, who, you know, was very thoughtful and said, if there's no hematochesia, no steatorrhea. And you're, you're tolerating PO intake, you know, we'll just keep an eye on it. You can try some loperamide. And I thought, well, problem solved. And then I got a lad that floated back into my inbox, and his creatinine went from normal to 11. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And it turns out that he had uh, salmonellosis that I was just – I was completely dismissive about just sort of given my past interactions with him. So he must have been just pooping his poor brains out. But I just – I – I took too much context and rather than actually paying attention to what the patient was telling me. So it was just, you made me think of sort of my own story of a personal failure and what I sort of learned from it. So it's, it's just such a great question to ask. So I, and I think it takes a little bit of courage to, to answer it honestly. So I actually, I really appreciate Joel's answer. Your brain can't solve the problem if it's trying to answer the wrong question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very true. Okay. Well, Joel, let's, let's uh, briefly talk about uh, tweetorials before we move on to the main topic here. So this has been something that's been emerging on uh, Twitter, uh, medical Twitter, in which people use Twitter, but not with just a single tweet to give a single idea, but to give a, a longer, more nuanced uh, teaching point. And they'll spread this teaching point through 10, 12, 20 tweets that will include links to the literature, images, polls to ask people. And, um, they've been, they're, they're fascinating because they've, they've adapted this very limited, uh, kind of medium to really have a much richer interaction. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a number of people that are really good at this. I'd, I'd like to focus on this guy named Tony Brew. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's, it's his Twitter handle is Tony underscore B R E U. And he's a, he's a hospitalist at the VA in Boston and he just picks really interesting um, aspects of medical physiology that have real interesting um, implications for clinical medicine. And, uh, you know, I'd highly recommend you take a, you, uh, give him a follow. His, very, his pinned tweet is a link to all of these tutorials. They're fascinating. And the other one, the person that I, that I first kind of learned about the medium 
from is this guy named Professor Daryl Francis, who's a um, cardiologist. He led the Orbita trial, which was a sham controlled trial of angioplasty and stable angina that showed that there was no improvement in symptoms uh, after angioplasty, which is like crazy to think about. Um, but it's one of the only sham controlled trials of angioplasty. Uh, his Twitter handle is at prof, P-R-O-F, D Francis, F R or Francis. I think it's Francis, F-R-A-N-C-I-S. Yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. But um, he does really interesting uh, tutorials on different aspects of statistics and trial design that are super interesting. Really, really well done stuff. Very, very thoughtful. Um, and to me, it's just, it's this real kind of uh, evolution of the medium. It's uh, it's pretty neat. And I think, I think they're going to catch on. I do. I do. Was too. it Tony who just did the uh, the periorbital edema in the yep. syndrome versus yep. uh, just heart failure? Yeah, that's it's good stuff. It is good stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. He, and he did another one on um, uh, why normal saline isn't normal. Why uh, why is the sodium one fifty four rather than one forty? Really interesting yeah. stuff. Uh, I love I love all that. It's uh, yeah. It's good to it's good to go back and and kind of remember the physiology, which we're going to be doing a lot of tonight. Paul Stewart, before we move on, did you guys have any burning picks of the week that you wanted to share? No, I think we've had enough. I won't speak for Paul though. Nah, not really. Okay, I think we should move. I'm going to recommend that watch The Shallows. <laughs> if you've not watched that yet, watch that again. It's a great shark movie. Go enjoy. It's summertime. <laughs> I don't have any. I had mine Scare- on, on yeah. mute. Terrify yourself with a shark attack movie <laughs> before you before you go to the beach. I, I believe I'm going in uh, two days, Paul. So maybe I'll watch. Oh, yeah, maybe I'll sure watch that watch. with my three, three, five, and six year olds. Uh, see what they see what they think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to a clinical case from Cashlack Memorial Hospital, where uh, I was seeing Lieutenant Yuhora with her name is changed for her protection. So she, she's a 32 year old female. Came in with fatigue, weakness, and some muscle aches, which are pretty vague. And she also had hypokalemia. She had slight hyperchloremia and a non-gap acidosis. Her gap was was 7. So her her K was 3.1. Her bicarb was 17 with a gap of 7. And we did we did get the the VBG, Joel. Her pH was 7.34. We weren't just assuming she had an acidosis. Is this an RTA is the question, and, and you're going to kind of tell us how to get there. So how do you like to initially approach this question of you know, non, non-anion gap metabolic acidosis? Right. So first, I want to just applaud the correct approach so that you see a decreased bicarb with no anion gap. You're not sure it's metabolic acidosis versus respiratory alkalosis until you get the VBG or the ABG and look at the pH. So in this case, the pH is decreased the CO2 is decreased, and the bicarb is decreased. Everything's moving in one direction, so it's a metabolic acidosis. And then correctly, you go to the next step, you take a look at the anion gap. Her anion gap is 7, so you have a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. And so when you have a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, there are three big buckets to consider. Okay. So the biggest bucket of all is diarrhea. Okay. It's going to be the number one cause of non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, (laughs) <laughs> yes. Sorry. No I, it is no coincidence that we are using buckets here. <laughs> just all take a deep breath. Let's just move past this. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. It's too highbrow for me. Yeah, that's right. So uh, GI loss is number one cause of non anion get metabolic acidosis. And then when you see that low potassium, it, it further kind of solidifies there. It really is going to look like, uh, or that's very consistent with increased GI losses of bicarbonate or diarrhea. Um and so that's what you want to think of first because it's the most common by far. Okay. So don't be reaching for the zebra of RTA if you haven't uh, taken a look at wh- whether your patient has C. diff or salmonella or shigella or whatever, whatever is causing them to poop their brains out. That's the most common cause of your non get metabolic acidosis. So occasionally you get some weird ones. So cholestyramine can cause GI losses of bicarb. So that can also be there. Um, there's a couple of surgical procedures. Um, if you have a patient who's lost their bladder, usually due to bladder cancer, they'll have to have a diverting procedure so that the ureter goes. In the old days, it used to be a ureterosigmoidostomy. They implant the ureter into the sigmoid colon, and then you would literally urinate through your colon. And um, uh, the problem there is 
you would have your kidney would norm, would work normally, excrete a lot of acid, a lot of potassium, and then that urine would rest in the sigmoid colon before you pooped it out. And that epithelium is just not designed to maintain the massive concentration gradients, right? Urine pH is going to be 4.5 to 4.5 up to 5.5 typically. Remember, serum pH is 7.4. This is a logarithmic scale. So you're talking about somewhere between 100 to 1000 to one ratio for hydrogen ions. And that sigmoid epithelium just can't maintain that concentration gradient. And so that hydrogen will back diffuse from the sigmoid into the body. This is a metabolic nightmare. And so we, that surgical procedure has been abandoned. And the current procedure is called a ureteroileostomy, where they take a small loop of ileum, they implant the ureter to the ileum, and then they tack the ileum to the skin and the patient wears the urostomy back. Here, they usually don't have metabolic abnormalities unless that ureteroileostomy gets obstructed and the urine spends a lot of time in contact with that ileal epithelium, and you get the same type of problem. But if there's no obstruction, if there's no blind loops where the urine can pool, usually these patients do well. So that's just a kind of a variation on what we were talking about in terms of GI losses as a cause of non get metabolic acidosis. The second bucket is another unusual one. This is called chloride intoxication. And so you had mentioned that Lieutenant Uhura had hyperchloremia, which is part of the non-anion get metabolic acidosis syndrome, but you can get that hyperchloridemia, hyperchloremia from uh, chloride intoxication. So you can get this from someone who's on normal saline, right? So normal saline has a sodium con- a chloride concentration of 154 millimoles per liter. This is wildly non-physiologic, <laughs> right? And that very high chloride concentration, right, compared to a hundred of where it normally is, uh, when you when you flow in 154 per liter, you can jack up that serum chloride and it causes a non-anion get metabolic acidosis. And there's kind of been a lot of people been looking at this and they've been wondering, is this detrimental? Does this non-anion get metabolic acidosis that we cause when we use normal saline, does it cause problems for patients? And um, just this past fall, or excuse me, this past spring, uh, there was two studies in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at choice of maintenance fluids, one for ER patients and another one for ICU patients. And both of them found a a, a rare but real uh, problem if you used normal saline as opposed to a balanced solution like lactated ringers. And the presumption is that it's this very high chloride and this non get metabolic acidosis that causes the problem. And so we're starting to kind of, you know, finally answer that longstanding question that, you know, you know, surgeons use lactated ringers and internists use normal saline. And we always just kind of thought it was just a fight, uh, between the two. But now we really have empiric data that shows that the, that the surgeons were right. And that kind of, yeah. kind of painful to say. <laughs> <laughs> and Neff, Neff Journal Club has a great, a great post that sort of, it just has all the resources that you would need to sort of learn way in depth about those trials, uh, which I would recommend. So I can put that in the show notes so people can yeah, go that'd through be great. it. You know, yeah. even a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> 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 okay. So use more <laughs> lactated ringers uh, instead of uh, normal saline. Is, that's my take home. That's what I'm trying to push. But, you know, it's still a lot of yeah. people are still coming into the hospital on normal saline. That's what the, the ER is still using a lot of that. So. I'm not sure they believe these trials yet. Yeah. I, I think I've started using a lot more LR. Yeah. yeah. It, to me, the more IV fluid I'm giving, the more likely I am to push LR. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So if it's just going to be a, a, a short period of time on a little bit of maintenance fluids, I'm not sure if it really matters. But mm-hmm. as that volume goes up and the duration goes up, I really do think it makes a difference. And you want to avoid these kind of avoidable metabolic abnormalities. And that's what right. LR allows you to do. And it kind of muddies the picture, so it's kind of hard to know what's going on. That, yeah, that's right. The last thing you need with a complex patient is a iatrogenic, not an get metabolic acidosis to deal with. The other place we'll see this chloride intoxication uh, classically is in the recovery phase of DKA. So if you take a look at the natural history of DKA, you flood them with normal saline, and then afterward, after you've closed the gap, right? So you're like, oh, the gap is closed. We can stop the insulin drip. But they still have this low bicarbon and normal anion gap. And the presumed etiology there is going to be the high chloride infusion, plus they lose um, 
they actually uh, urinate out a lot of the uh, the ketones instead of the chloride. So the ketones go out. That's the anion that they lose in the urine, and they're they're retaining of the chloride instead. And so they end up with this non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Um, and that's kind of the late kind of recovery phase of DKA. So that'll be another situation where you'll see that. And then the last bucket is RTAs. And the, the, th- the thing about the, the renal tubular acidosis is that they're, they end up being, it's kind of one of these diseases much more common on the boards than it is on the wards. Right. You know, I've, I've seen a dozen cases of type two RTA. Most of them, most of them, uh, on the boards again. So <laughs> thank, thank so, goodness for that. Yeah. No, that, that's right. And, um, they are mostly helpful in kind of instructing you in how renal physiology, how the kidney normally handles, uh, bicarbonate and acid base and understanding kind of walking through that. So that you understand the physiology kind of gives you the background to make it easy to understand the RTAs. So I want to kind of walk through, uh, what's going on here. So the first thing is normally when we think about, um, how the kidney works is you, t- you filter a ton of fluid and then you reclaim valuable stuff and the kidney is mainly thought of an excretory uh, organ. But when it comes to bicarb, that's not at all the kidney's role. It's not excretory. The kidney has two roles. One, it's going to reabsorb all the filtered bicarbonate. And two, it's going to synthesize new bicarbonate to replace the bicarbonate that's consumed by the body. Okay, so those are the two primary roles. Reabsorb filtered bicarbonate and synthesize new bicarbonate. Uh, Lastly, it also needs to excrete uh, hydrogen ions from what's called the daily acid load. So let's kind of walk through those three steps one by one. So step one, if you think about normal GFR is 100 milliliters per minute and uh, normal serum bicarbonate is 24 millimoles per liter. So that means if you multiply uh, 0.1 liters a minute times 24 millimoles uh, per liter times 1,440 minutes in a day, you get uh, 3,456 millimoles of bicarbonate that are filtered every day. Okay. The largest bicarbonate pill that we have is, um, is 650 milligrams. That's roughly eight millimoles of bicarbonate. Okay. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to make up for what the proximal tubule does, you need to gobble up 18 of these, uh, bicarbonate pills every hour to keep up with the reabsorption of the proximal tubule. (laughs) That's probably some significant calories too. Put that in your brain hole. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So it's just this, it's this massive job of the proximal tubule and reabsorbing thousands upon thousands of millimoles of bicarbonate every day. Okay. And that's in contradiction to how, what happens in the, the distal nephron. The second job of the kidney is to handle, is to synthesize new bicarbonate. So all the time, just normal metabolism, you're consuming bicarbonate, right? So if you eat proteins that include methionine and cysteine, those are metabolized in the liver to sulfuric acid, and that's going to be neutralized by bicarbonate. Okay. And so in general, on a Western diet, we're going to consume Somewhere between about just about one millimole of bicarbonate per kilogram body weight. We call that the, this is the daily acid load. So you can think in a, you know, normal sized adults, you're talking about 70 to 80, uh, millimoles of bicarbonate consumed every day or 70 to 80 millimoles of hydrogen ions that need to be excreted by the kidney. Okay. Those are, those numbers are exactly the same because initially that hydrogen consumes bicarbonate and that bicarbonate needs to be replaced. And the process of replacing that bicarbonate means that you've also secreted hydrogen into the urine to be excreted. Okay, so when we talk about the daily acid load, that's just the amount of bicarbonate that's consumed with normal metabolism. That acid load can go up if the patient develops DKA or lactic acidosis. You're going to consume a lot of additional bicarbonate, and that demand is going to go up. But the important thing is we're talking about 50 to 70 millimoles of bicarbonate. This is not even close to the volume of what's happened in the proximal tubule where it's reabsorbing thousands of millimoles of bicarbonate. Right? So you have the proximal tubule reabsorbing 3,500 millimoles of bicarbonate, and then you have the distal nephron, kind of the end of the uh, distal convoluted tubule and the beginning of the 
um, a cortical collecting duct where you're going to be uh, secreting hydrogen and creating de novo bicarbonate. And that's just going to be about, um, you know, 50 to 70 to 80 millimoles a day. So just vast differences in quantity. And then the last step is you need to get rid of that hydrogen. So you've secreted the hydrogen into the tubule. It's 60 to 80 millimoles of hydrogen. And we can get that urine pH down pretty acidic, down to about a pH of 4.5. So that's a really concentrated compared to plasma. It's a thousand times the concentrated as con- the concentration of hydrogen in the plasma. But if you convert that to millimoles per liter, it's 0.04 millimoles per liter. So if you have to get rid of, say, 50 millimoles of hydrogen at a concentration of 0.04 millimoles per liter, you'd need to make 1,250 liters of urine a day. (laughs) Right? So clearly, we do not excrete this hydrogen as hydrogen. Right? We need to stow it. We need to hide that hydrogen somewhere else. And there is two ultimate fates of that hydrogen. Um, one of them is called titratable acid, which is just, it's just, um, uh, hydrogen phosphate. So we take hydrogen phosphate. We add a hydrogen. We get dihydrogen phosphate and that's titratable acid. Um, and that gets rid of most of the daily acid load on a kind of a normal day to day basis. The other, place that we can store it is we take ammonium, ammonia, which is NH3, throw on an extra hydrogen. It's ammonium, NH4+, and we get rid of ammonium in the urine. The difference between the two is that titratable acid is kind of constitutive. There's just so much phosphorus in the urine, and we can't really upregulate it in the face of metabolic acidosis. But ammonium, on the other hand, if we need to get rid of excess hydrogen, the kidney can generate additional NH3 for it to accept an an additional hydrogen and get rid of that. So what you'll see is normally most of the uh, hydrogen is excreted as titratable acid, but in the face of metabolic acidosis of any etiology, you're going to ramp up ammonia production. That's going to accept an additional hydrogen and be excreted as ammonia. So in the face of bad diarrhea, you're going to see urine pH fall and you're going to see urine ammonium really rise as it starts to get rid of that excess acid load by stuffing that hydrogen onto ammonium. So a well-functioning kidney in the face of metabolic acidosis is going to have a lot of urinary ammonium. That's just how it's supposed to work. Mm-hmm. So those are the three steps. One, you got to reclaim all the filtered bicarbonate. Two, you need to create, synthesize new bicarbonate to get rid of um to replace the bicarbonate that's consumed by normal metabolism. And three, you need to hide that urinary hydrogen so you can get rid of the daily acid load without having to pee out stomach acid. Right? That would be the, no, that would be the other solution. If you get the urine pH down to one, then you could get rid of the urine, the urine hydrogen just as hydrogen. You wouldn't need to store it anywhere, but we can't that pee would out hurt. stomach acid. Presumably. <laughs> 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 right. Like, like the fact that your stomach can do it is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, why doesn't that hurt? <laughs> okay. It, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Tony Brew, <laughs> yeah, t- <laughs> <laughs> why don't we digest ourselves? <laughs> wait for the tutorial. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So those are the, those are the three, main roles of the kidney and um and i I think you know going through this uh joel and it seems like each of the different rtas you know the proximal distal you know they're all kind of focusing on different parts of the nephron so where do you want to go next and maybe we take one at a time yeah that and and that's why you divide it into these three different aspects of renal of renal um hydrogen handling because each one fails and when it fails it causes a different type of rta so the RTAs are just like the worst of nephrology. There are three of them. They go type 2, type 1, and type 4 in anatomic order. 2, 1, 4. It's just uh, – no, it's because nephrology hates you. That's horrible. It's, 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 it's – from, from, from looking through your stuff, this is the chronology of what, how they were discovered? That's why. Yeah, it's the order. That's why they it were doesn't. Discovered, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and at, at one point, they thought there was a type three, and then they were mistaken, and they eliminated it. And then the pediatricians say, "No, no, there really is a type three, but it's very short lived." I don't know if there's a type three. I don't care if there's a type three. You're only going to be tested on two, one, four. It's the only ones you're ever going to see if you see any of them at all. Okay. And that's actually not entirely true. 
type four, relatively common. And if you look for it, you see it pretty commonly. But let's go through each of them and they'll start to kind of make sense based on the physiology. So the proximal RTA. So this is damage to the proximal tubule that reabsorbs thousands of millimoles of bicarb a day. So first off, you can't have a complete type two or proximal RTA. That's a lethal disease. You would be dead in a few minutes if you lost that much bicarbonate. The only type of RTA that's physiologically interesting are the partial RTAs because those are the ones that are survivable. And the way to think about this is kind of, you want to remember the concept of um, TM from physiology. We usually talk about TM for glucose, right? So the TM for glucose is 200. It's the concentration in the plasma at which the kidney is just able to reabsorb all the filtered glucose. So the TM for glucose is 200. If your serum glucose is below that, you're going to reabsorb all the glucose and not pee any of it out. Okay, so when you have somebody who has glucosuria, you know that their serum glucose must be above 200 because they've exceeded that TM for glucose. And so when they talk about that, they should really point out that there's TMs for lots of compounds, including bicarbonate. And so normally the TM for bicarbonate is about 28. It can actually rise higher in certain circumstances. But generally, that TM for uh, bicarb is significantly higher than your normal serum serum bicarb of 24. And... But when you get damage to your proximal tubule, and it can come in a lot of different forms, it can be drug-induced, it can be due to uh, heavy metal toxicity, it can be due to uh, multiple myeloma, anything that damages the proximal tubule, it's going to lower that TM for bicarb. I, I just got to break in real quick. Could, could you define TM? Because I'm oh, not sure f- if we did. So just to make TM, sure their audience knows. Yep, that's right. So the TM is the thresh, threshold of maximum reabsorption. So it's the concentration right. at which the body or the proximal tubule can reabsorb all of the filtered load of whatever substance you're talking about. Right. So, so, so you're TM, saying that, for, for, for example, if you're saying that if the glucose is, is over 200, so at that point, then you're going to pee out the glucose, right? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure I'm following. So in, if you have some damage to the proximal tubule, your TM for bicarb, which is normally 28, is now going to fall. And let's say it'll, and it usually will fall to the mid teens, 16, 14. Let's call it new TM for bicarbonate is 14. Okay. So you're running around with a bicarb of 24, totally normal. You've damaged your proximal tubule. The new TM for bicarbonate is 14. Now your bicarb is way over your TM for bicarbonate. Your proximal tubule is going to work as hard as it can, but there's no way it can reabsorb all that bicarbonate. And you're going to start to pee out bicarbonate. You get bicarbonaturia. Your pH goes up to eight. You piss out all that bicarbonate. And over time, your bicarbonate dr- drops down. It goes from 24 to 20 to 16 to 14. Well, at 14, now you're at your TM for bicarbonate. Now the proximal tubule can reabsorb all that bicarbonate. Okay. It reabsorbs all that bicarbonate. The distal nephron does its job. Normally it keeps replacing the lost bicarbonate from the daily acid load and it keeps it right at 14. You've kind of just set a new set point. Instead of being at 24, the new set point is 14. And if you get DKA on top of that, the kidney's going to, your bicarb will drop down to 10 or 8, and then the kidney will work it back up to 14, or if you get lactic acidosis, or if you're, if the, if your doctor says, oh, your bicarb's too low, let me feed you some bicarbonate, your bicarbonate will rise to 16 or 17, but you can't reabsorb it 16 or 17, so it just piss out that additional <laughs> bicarbonate. It really makes, uh, uh, proximal RTA exceedingly difficult to treat, right? Because the kidney just can't hold on to that bicarbonate. Anytime you raise the bicarbonate up a little bit, you're going to increase the urinary excretion of bicarbonate. And when you increase urinary excretion of bicarbonate, all those negative, all those anions that you're going to excrete out, grab onto potassium along with it and cause a significant um, hypokalemia also. So one of the prominent symptoms of a proximal RTA is hypokalemia, but only when you try to treat it, <laughs> right? It's the, it's the treating it itself that causes the bicarbonaturia that drags out the potassium. And so these patients, they're really difficult to treat. The body really works against you normalizing the bicarb, but especially in kids, it's important to try to do it because the further you get the bicarb up, the more these kids grow. And so, and we see a, a number of congenital diseases, um, have a proximal RTA as a component of it. And so 
pediatric nephrologists are always trying to feed these kids more and more bicarbonate and then have to give them more and more potassium to chase after it. It's a metabolically diff- difficult condition. You know, so what happens if they, you know, what, what, what are the consequences of living with that low bicarbonate? So one, the kids don't grow. Two, well, if they can't, if they have that low bicarbonate, they're going to buffer that acid some other way. And unfortunately, they end up using their bones to buffer that bicarbonate. And so these patients get a lot of osteoporosis. There was a study looking at, um, people with, uh, kind of, uh, incomplete or partial or minimal type two or proximal RTA. And, uh, they had a lot of osteoporosis there that this ends up being kind of this occult source of, uh, bone deterioration, something to, to think about. Realistically, so just kind of in our practice, it sounds like we're pretty unlikely that we're going to see a, a major case of this in adults. At least I don't know that I've seen many of them. And if we do, we're probably. I'm sure you've seen it, uh-huh. right? Because I'm sure you have a patient on topiramate. Okay. Right. So topiramate, we use it for, uh, it's an anti-seizure medication. It's used for uh, migraine prophylaxis. And one of its components is a, um, it's. Uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, which acts as a drug-induced proximal RTA. And so they'll get an elevated urine pH and, um, and that can cause, uh, one of the, one of the consequences in this, in this situation is they get kidney stones. They get the classic kidney stones of alkalotic urine, which is a calcium phosphate stone. Uh, I've had patients with calcium phosphate stones from topiramate. Have you guys seen that before? That complication of that disease? Drug? I've, uh, yes, I've seen, I have seen people with kidney stones that were on topiramate. Yes. I did not, I did not realize that was, uh, that was similar physiologically to a proximal to proximal RTA or the same as a proximal RTA. Yeah. So, and then when I went to the Himalayas a couple months ago, I took uh, acetazolamide to prevent altitude sickness, which again is a drug induced proximal RTA. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we don't classically think of it as an RTA because it's drug induced, but same physiology there. So just if I'm understanding correctly, if we don't give bicarb, there's going to be problems with osteoporosis from bone buffering, where they're sort of taking minerals out of their bones to buffer the acid. And if we do give bicarb, then they're going to become hypokalemic and we're going to have to feed them tons and tons of bicarb in order to uh, keep up with this. If they have like a Fanconi's, like a, the, the proximal tubule is just damaged. It's not a drug induced. I guess if it's drug induced, you just stop the drug, right? Or um, uh, uh, tenofovir, which was uh, the uh, the one pill once a day anti HIV medication, this classically caused uh, proximal tubular damage, and they would also get a proximal RTA. So another drug induced, but that one not reversible when stopping the drug. That would be kind of a permanent consequence of that drug. So you know these things are lurking out there. They exist. Um, multiple myeloma is another one that can damage the proximal tubule. Every attending is going to talk about the patient that had the the, the low anion gap metabolic acidosis. That they'll they're like, oh, I wonder if that's a multiple myeloma. And they'll do an SPEP or UPEP and be able to pick up the diagnosis. So another uh, another finding again, these aren't common diseases, but they're out there. They're lurking, and they're things you don't want to miss. As always, I'm going to ask the audience to uh, you know send us send us a message either on Twitter or email us if you pick up something based on uh, what Joel's teaching you here, <laughs> <laughs> so we can brag about it. Obviously, <laughs> yeah, I won't bill them. <laughs> Okay, so I think that's pretty good. Uh, anything else about proximal RTA that we should talk about, or you want to move on to the next one? Yeah, let's move. Let's move on. Let's move on. So, moving down the nephron, you get to the uh, the distal nephron, and um, we kind of glossed over, but I want to walk back a little bit and talk about how hydrogen is secreted in the um, distal convoluted tu- uh, distal convoluted tubule and the uh, cortical collecting duct. So those areas are kind of near the end of the nephron, uh, and they're anatomically separate. One of them we call a tubule, one they call a duct. But uh, in terms of the uh, transporters, they're identical. Okay. And to see the we talked already that the hydrogen ion concentration in the urine is super high compared to the plasma, right? A hundred to one to a thousand to one gradient. And that it ends up being, it's kind of difficult to move hydrogen into that gradient. There's two factors that are required to do it. So one, we need to get a negative charge in the tubule. And we do that by reabsorbing sodium 
through what's called the ENAC channel. It's one of kind of the rare locations in the kidney where you're moving a cation and you don't have an anion moving in the same direction or a cation moving in the opposite direction. So you get this electrogenic movement, moving the, reabsorbing that sodium there. And the sodium is just flowing down its concentration gradient because you have a very low intracellular sodium concentration because of the action of the sodium potassium ATPase. Sodium flows down its concentration gradient and leaves a negative charge in the tubule. And that negative charge acts like a magnet to pull out both potassium and hydrogen. But that's not enough to get the hydrogen at this high, very high gradient. You also have a hydrogen ATPase, which converts ATP to ADP and moves one hydrogen ion out. And so you need both the negative charge from the negative tubule and the power of ATP to pump out hydrogen to get this massive gradient, urine pH of 4.5 to 5.5. Okay? And then the last step, and this is kind of what we were talking about when we were talking about these surgical procedures, is you need to have this specialized and intact uh, epithelium to prevent that hydrogen from back diffusing. So there's three things. One, you need to be able to reabsorb sodium. Two, you need to have a hydrogen ATPase. And three, you need to have an intact epithelium. Those are the three steps to having the distal nephron secrete hydrogen. And all three steps can fail in this distal RTA or type Mm -hmm. 1 RTA. So in a classic RTA, you have some kind of autoimmune damage to the hydrogen ATPase. Okay? So you can't pump out any hydrogen by consuming ATP. Mm -hmm. You still have that nice negative charge there. And that negative charge... Not only does it draw out hydrogen, which is now broken because you've lost your hydrogen ATPase, but it also draws out potassium. Okay. And normally, hydrogen secretion and potassium secretion both compete for that negative charge. But we've just taken hydrogen off the table. And so now potassium is, it doesn't have to compete anyway, and you just get massive potassium secretion. And so classic distal RTA is associated with hypokalemia. That's the first one. The second one is you break down your uh, sodium reabsorption, so you don't get this negative charge in the tubule. And we said that's super important for both hydrogen secretion and potassium secretion, and both of those get shut down or dramatically decreased if you can't secrete sodium. And the classic example of this is going to be amiloride, right? That's a drug that focuses on that sodium reabsorption right there, that ENAC channel. If that happens, you're unable to secrete Potassium, you're unable to secrete hydrogen. So this is a distal RTA associated with hyperkalemia. Okay. This one we'll see. Not only do you have the drug induced one with amiloride, this one rarely you can see it with sickle cell. You can also see it with patients that have chronic urinary obstruction. Right. If you think about people that get obstructed, they oftentimes will have a non anagap metabolic acidosis and hyperkalemia. This is the mechanism. Okay. And we said, and we said the last step here is you need to have an intact epithelium. And the only disease that I know that affects that epithelium is amphotericin B, right? This is an antifungal agent and it rips holes in, uh, the fungal cell membrane and it also can rip holes in this intact epithelium that maintains this hydrogen gradient. And so ampho B is another cause of RTA. You secrete the hydrogen, but it just back diffuses. Okay, Joel, I want to make sure that I'm getting this. So you, like you said, there's the three, so kind of, and there's a great, uh, Joel has another great PowerPoint that he made to go along with this. Well, even before our show existed, he had a PowerPoint that I imagine he's been working on. <laughs> but of course, I, I it will be it will be available on his site and on our, our site for you to download. And you can see he has some great figures there. So the, the distal RTA, what I thought was kind of cool about this, Joel, is it's really like, there's there's almost like three flavors of it, which which in a way makes it more complicated, but it, it helps you, like you said, understand the physiology of the kidney by figuring out how it can go wrong. And then I think you gave us a good way to remember it. So like the ENAC channel being blocked is the first way. The sodium can't be reabsorbed because that channel's defective for whatever reason or it's blocked by a drug. And then the, eight, the hydrogen ATPase was the other one. And then lastly was this specialized epithelium uh, is there's holes in it so the hydrogen and the potassium can go back, f- uh, flow back through. Am I yes, right there? That's a, yeah, you got it. You got it. You nailed it. Okay. So that's, that is your distal RTA. The major hallmark there 
is they're going to get alkalotic urine. Okay, they're not going to be able to acidify their urine. Anytime you have an inability to acidify your urine, you're going to get calcium phosphate stones. Okay, and so when you're on board, you got somebody who's got metabolic acidosis or not going to get metabolic acidosis, the tell is going to be they have stones. Two things to know. One, that's probably going to be a distal RTA. And two, it's going to be a calcium phosphate stone. Right, so we had talked about when you get rid of titratable acid, you're converting just HPO4 two minus to H2PO4 one minus. Okay. And if you have a lot of, if you do not acidify your urine, you're going to have a lot of HPO4 two minus and that two minus is going to bind beautifully to the two plus calcium. And that gets you your calcium phosphate stone. If you acidify your urine, you're going to convert that H2 or that HPO4 two minus to H2. 2 PO4 1 minus, and that doesn't bind up to the calcium very well. And so, uh, there's, that's going to generate your calcium phosphate stones. And so, uh, that is, and that's very, you know, only 10% of kidney stones are calcium phosphate. The 70% of them are all calcium oxalate. So it's a little bit problematic because usually patients, when they, you tell them that they have a stone, they only remember whether it's calcium or not calcium. And you really need the last name. Is it an oxalate or a phosphate to make this diagnosis? Right. Um, but that's an important aspect. They're also going to get the same osteoporosis and problems from buffer, using their bones to buffer their acid instead of using their kidney. So they also get the same kind of uh, bone. So it's bones and stones in distal RTA or type 1 RTA. Okay. And it kind of doesn't matter which of the three mechanisms it is. All three of them will cause those same side effects. Um, and that the differentiation is going to be the potassium. Right. So if it's an electrogenic, if it's a problem with the ENAC channel, they'll be hyperkalemic. But the vast majority of them, classic distal, will be hypokalemic, just like your proximal RTAs are also hypokalemic. So how are we going to treat these patients uh, with with, uh, you know, with the proximal type? We sort of talked about how if you give too much bicarb, it can cause problems because then you're chasing the potassium. So what about with this one? What do what do you recommend? Okay. So I, w- and I would also go back to thinking, well, when we talked about the proximal nephron, we were saying, oh, it has to handle thousands of milliequivalents of bicarb, right? And it's like this, it, it was boil the ocean type of thing. But here in the distal nephron, we said, well, it's about 80 milliequivalents. If it's completely dysfunctional, it has to get rid of the daily acid load, about one milliequivalent per kilogram body weight. Well, that's a digestible amount. That's at the most 10 of those uh, bicarb pills a day. Usually it won't be complete. They'll be able to get rid of, get by on two, four, or six of these, and you'll be able to normalize their acid base status. This is an achievable goal without the problems of the hypokalemia or anything else. Okay. Unfortunately, it can make the stone situation worse, right? Because the problem with the stones is the alkalotic urine. And what are you doing? You're feeding them a bunch of bicarb. Um, but you do what you need to do. Can you get a little specific about the uh, the form of the bicarb? Is there any specific tabs solution? Does it matter? And what what for? Like you know, what strength is out there? Is it seems to be relatively variable. Right. So there's two size pills. So it's the three twenty fives and the six fifty milligram sodium bicarbonate pills. The six fifties have eight mil equivalents of bicarbonate per pill. Uh, 325s will have about four mil equivalents of bicarbonate per pill. And what you're looking for is to neutralize the daily acid load, which is going to be about one millimole, uh, of bicarbonate per kilogram body weight. But you're really going to titrate it to their serum bicarbonate. You want to get that serum bicarbonate above 22, which generally kind of minimizes any of the metabolic abnormalities. So you'll give them enough to neutralize that. And again, it's an achievable amount. So the alternative is to use baking soda. It's one teaspoon is 60 milliequivalents, which is probably their daily dose. So one teaspoon, mix it up in a glass of water, half in the morning, half at night, boom, you're done. Um, it's important that your patient doesn't mistake a teaspoon for a tablespoon and get three times the anticipated <laughs> dose, right? <laughs> this stuff is industrial strength, right? Like it's, it's, you take a look at that, that, that box of Arm and Hammer in your, in your 
refrigerator and they take a tablespoon of that and they are going to get a wicked metabolic alkalosis. So make sure they understand what the proper dose is. But I have a number of patients that prefer to take bicarbonate in that form. So with the the 650 uh, milligram tabs, if you're giving them eight tabs, that's about 64 milli equivalents of bicarb. So for a 64 kilogram person, that might replace, you know, that, that might replace all of what they're losing or all of what they need to generate if they're not able to generate it. That, and that, that would be someone who has lost complete ability right. in their distal nephron to do this. And that's usually not how the disease sure. prevents. They've, they've lost some percentage of it and you just need to compensate for that percentage. Yeah. So, and again, all you need to do is you titrate it to their bicarb, to their serum bicarb. Got it. All right. So the last, the last t- type is this hypoaldosteroneism or what, how do you, how do you call this? Do you call it type four or do you call it, call it type four? I call it type four. Type four. Okay. Right. And so if you remember the last step that we talked about in the physiology of renal acid hand, we had to stow the hydrogen ions in either titratable acid or ammonia. And, and actually not in ammonia, in ammonium. You convert ammonia to ammonium. And that's what, um, that's what you're doing in this, this type four is a failure to be able to convert, uh, to stow hydrogen as ammonium. These patients have a lack of urinary ammonia. And so they can't stow their additional, um, hydrogen ions. So they will acidify their urine. They'll urine back down to, you're in pH of 5.5 or 5.0, but that just doesn't get rid of, that gets rid of like 0.1% of the daily acid load. You need to be able to store this in ammonium. And if they don't generate the ammonia, they can't do that. And the reason they can't generate the ammonia is that in the proximal tubule where you generate that ammonia, it is very sensitive to hyperkalemia. And as the serum potassium goes up, ammonia genesis goes down. And so the initiating problem here is the hyperkalemia. The hyperkalemia prevents the kidney from producing the ammonia. So even though they secrete the hydrogen just fine, they can't, that hydrogen can't be uh, hidden as ammonium. And normally what happens is you hide that hydrogen as ammonium, that raises the pH a little bit. You're able to secrete a little bit more and you hide a little bit more as ammonium. And that whole process gets short circuited because you just don't have the ammonia available. And the problem is the hyperkalemia. Our chair of medicine, uh, Dr. Dr. Robert Centaur, on his MedRants blog, has a nice post about this, Joel, that you, uh, you had referred me to. So I'll also put that one in the show notes. You're our chief of nephrology, so technically he's your it, boss. It, not just technically. That man, the man knows his stuff. <laughs> he's, 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 a, he's really good. He, I, I think he may. He's one of the few people I know who's been blogging for longer <laughs> than you have. So we'll... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and people actually read right. his so, book. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you guys both have, you guys both have great blogs. I, I've, uh, I've learned a lot from reading both of them. Okay. Sorry. So I interrupted you here. We're talking about ammonia genesis and how hyperkalemia kind of shuts that down. So where's, where's the def, where's the defect here? Uh, d- is it just any cause of hyperkalemia that causes this? Yeah, bingo. It's any cause of hyperkalemia, but it has to be chronic. It, ha- it can't be a momentary increase in potassium. It has to be chronic hyperkalemia. Um, and the one that is typically that we see most commonly is going to be, um, longstanding diabetes, uh, causing, um, uh, hyporenin, hypoaldo. And if you don't have enough aldosterone, you're going to increase your serum potassium and that's going to result in this condition. Some people try to say the lack of aldo prevents the hydrogen secretion, right? Because aldo is going to be involved in hydrogen secretion proximally. Um, that's not ended up to be the problem. And the proof of that is these patients have a nice acid urine, right? The hydrogen secretion is intact. Their urine pH is very, very low. They're just not getting that ammonium. And that's from that increased potassium. Yeah, I have, I never heard that before. I, I always was just thinking, okay, aldosterone's action, you secrete hydrogen. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, that's yeah, right. Yeah, you secrete hydrogen, you secrete potassium, uh, secrete potassium. So if you don't have it, you get, you get elevated, uh, potassium in your serum and you get acidosis. But so it's, it's actually the ammonia that's the thing. The ammonia genesis from the hyperkalemia. Is, yes. 
<laughs> it is actually the ammonium that's the problem. And the, and like I said, the proof is that these patients acidify their urine just fine. It's not like a distal RTA or a type one RTA where they'll have a urine pH of six and a half, seven. These patients will get their urine pH down to five, but that's just, you know, cause their hydrogen secretions intact. They just can't get, they just can't stow the uh, hydrogen in ammonium. Mm. When I was looking this up, it seems like there's a lot of culprit medications that can cause this, not just like a, uh, not just diabetes. So uh, even heparin was one of them. Is this something that you think clinically is uh, is relevant for us to know? I, I always have seen it listed. Yeah, I I, I, I always listed in my consults. I'm never convinced that it's actually the heparin that's the problem. I'm I'm just <laughs> I, I don't think so, um, but. Uh, so the idea is that heparin seems to decrease aldosterone synthesis, which is the problem. But the real culprit medications are going to be ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, spironolactone, um, aldactone, uh, plerinone, anything that's going to cause that chronic hyperkalemia is going to be the problematic drug there. How do you generally treat these patients with a type 4 RTA? So I guess if there's a medication, you stop the medication if you can. Right. So the reality is is they have a potassium of 6 and they have a bicarb of 22. And do you really care about the bicarb of 22 and the potassium of 6? Right? Like usually the uh, yeah. the acidosis part is just forgotten. It ends up not being that important compared to potassium. And everybody uh, behaves correctly focuses on the potassium and corrects that. And whether that's adding uh, a thiazide or a loop diuretic to help with calyuresis or backing off on the ACE inhibitor or some other mechanism to treat the hyperkalemia, that's really what you focus on and the acidosis will get better and you won't even notice that you fixed it because you weren't even aware of it in the first place. The acidosis from this disease tends to be relatively mild compared to the hyperkalemia. Right. And if you think about the type fours that you've dealt with in the, in the clinic, what are you usually worried about? It's usually the potassium. Yeah. 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 I, I think the, the last place to go here would be, of course, go back to the case. And then maybe if you could tell us a little bit about the urine anion gap. Yeah. No, I think, you think I th- that's, is there anything else you guys think I'm missing? Mm-mm. Okay. Yeah. So the, the skill that uh, people want you to know on boards is looking at the urinary anion gap. And what this is, is this is a way to figure out the urine ammonium level, right? That the idea is that a proximal, distal, and type 4 RTA, all these patients will be unable to generate a lot of urinary ammonium, right? Because urinary ammonium is going to be the proper renal response to a metabolic acidosis. And if they have a renal tubular acidosis, they're not going to generate that ammonium. Okay. And so the great way to do this is if we could just send the urine for ammonium, we would be able to get our answer. And there is, and there is literally no reason why your lab doesn't do it except for they need to recalibrate the machine. And then none of them want to do that, right? <laughs> They're like, "No, I'm not going to do that for you, Doctor Toff. You're going to. I'm not going to tell you what the urine, renal ammonia level, renal uh, kidney, renal ammonia, urine ammonia level. I'm going to make you indirectly measure it by uh, doing this uh, math. This is where our our friend the gamble gram comes back. I you, you have them in your slides again, so. Yeah, right. So the, the, I, the idea here, so we need to find some kind of way of detecting ammonium and ammonium is a cation. We know that the urine anions must equal the urine cations and the dominant urine anion is chloride. And then the urine cations are sodium and potassium. And so if there is a lot of ammonium, your urine sodium plus your urine potassium will be less than your urine chloride because the thing that's not being measured is the cation urine ammonia, ammonium. Right. Okay. So if you have a properly functioning kidney in the face of a non anagat metabolic acidosis like a big diarrhea, you're going to have urine sodium plus urine potassium be less than urine chloride. So the urine anion gap is urine sodium plus potassium minus urine chloride, and you're going to get a negative number because the urine chloride is going to be bigger than your sodium and potassium. That negative number means uh, normal renal function, or it points to GI losses as the cause. And the um, the mnemonic is neg gut 
negative, where you have gut as in guts and the negative. So if you have a negative urinary anion gap, that means it's GI. And if you have a positive urinary anion gap, that points to an RTA. And I, I did actually get some urine uh, urine lights on Lieutenant Yehora, and her urine pH was 6.5. She had a urine sodium of 80. Her urine potassium was 45, and her urine chloride was 115. So if you calculate her gap, it's so it's 80 plus 45 minus 115. So you get 125 minus 115. You have a urine gap of 10, positive 10. Positive 10. So she has a positive, positive urine, urine anion gap. So Joel, that's uh, what does this tell us then? That's going to point to an RTA. She had the hypokalemia, um, and then she had those vague musculoskeletal uh, uh, symptoms. I think she's got uh, uh, scleroderma or some kind of crest type situation, some kind of uh, uh, autoimmune disease focused on the distal nephron. She's got a type one or distal RTA classic causing hypokalemia. Feed her some bicarb. She'll get better. <laughs> That's, I, I, I think I'm actually finally getting this. I, I don't know. Uh, D- Paul Stewart, are you guys using urine anion gaps uh, in your practice? Not routinely. <laughs> It, I'll be honest. I, not routinely, virtually never. I think exactly one time, just because I know I'll have to do something with it when it comes back. So this is hugely <laughs> yeah. helpful. I there was a super smart med student that was working with us, and he was just coming off like a PhD. Like he had taken a break after second year, done a PhD, and then was coming back to clinical rotations. And he was like, he diagnosed an RTA. He's like, I did a urine anion gap, and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, let me see your number. Let me see your work there. <laughs> As one does, sure. <laughs> and I just pretended I was like, "Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, seems uh, work seems to check out here." <laughs> I pass. Yeah, it, it. <laughs> right. Educator. <laughs> no, I, I I admitted that I didn't know what I was talking about in this. I was like, "I'm gonna have to do some reading on this." You're making me realize. So that's why that's why we're doing this podcast for that med student. <laughs> <laughs> if only I remembered his name, I'd give him a shout out. And we wish him the best of luck in orthopedic surgery. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no way, I'm going to Derm. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, anything else we have here? So we kind of we went through the urine anion gap. We've gone through the different types of RTAs. We've gone through the three buckets. Uh, I guess you were talking a little bit on Twitter today about uh, replacing bicarb in someone with with diarrhea or like kind of GI losses of of bicarb. Right. So you know, uh, my my kind of modus operandi has always been that if I have somebody with a non anion gap metabolic acidosis, I would pretty freely give them oral or IV bicarbonate to correct that, and. Um, and I started looking for data to support kind of how I did things and um, didn't find a lot to support it. In fact, I was looking at the World Health Organization. They they really focus a lot on oral rehydration solutions. So they treat a lot of um, or make recommendations on how to treat a lot of infectious diarrhea, pretty people with profound uh, cholera or parasite, parasitic diarrhea. Thank you. And so these patients have profound diarrhea, massive metabolic abnormalities. And if you take a look at what they recommend for replacing that, they want to give some glucose, they want to give some uh, sodium, they give a little some chloride, and they have very little alkali, right? Uh, so usually they'll throw in some citrate somewhere between 8 and 12 mil equivalents per liter of replacement solution, just not very much, significantly less than what your serum bicarbonate is. And, you know, these patients do well. This is the best way to treat these uh, metabolic abnormalities of diarrhea. And I think it just, I think it goes back that the problem with diarrhea is not the acid-based abnormality. The problem with diarrhea is the volume depletion. And if you can refloat their kidneys, if you can get their kidneys working again, their kidneys are going to compensate for that acid-based disorder. And it's not that profound. And that seems to be uh, what the data supports. I was looking for data that shows these patients do better if you give them alkali. And I just, I couldn't find any of it anywhere. Um, so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is a, a study that I haven't come across 
that shows that this ends up being important. But it feels like it's this is something that I do because it makes the uh, Kemp 7 look pretty, but it doesn't really seem to make a big difference in terms of uh, making the patient healthier. The important thing for diarrhea is not surprisingly just get the, get those patients doing better. Again, if you're going to give them uh, IV rehydration, it makes sense to use a balanced solution like a lactated ringers that does provide some alkali rather than giving them normal saline that, you know, they already have a non-anion get metabolic acidosis. Don't give them normal saline that's going to make that non-anion get metabolic acidosis even worse. That just doesn't seem to make sense. And I would say we now have some empiric data that giving normal saline does make them worse, does make these patients sicker, at least causes acute kidney injury in the ICU. And so, uh, you know, for a kind of an innocuous decision about which rehydration solution to use, LR is probably the better solution to choose, lactated ringers. But again, I, you know, I want to, I just want to kind of, I want to just step back and kind of give you a quick review of the RTA for you to think about the classic, uh, tell. So a 25 year old patient, non anion gap metabolic acidosis, recurrent kidney stones as part of the stem. You want to think about a type one RTA. If they're hypokalemic, it'll be a classic RTA, a uh, classic distal. If they're hyperkalemic, it can be an electrogenic, uh, RTA. But if they, if Part of the history is kidney stones. You want to think about a distal RTA. And if they talk about the type of stones, don't get sucked into calcium oxalate. Don't start talking about strawberries and rhubarb or all the things that have a lot of oxalate. You want to focus on calcium phosphate. This is usually usually going to be a distal RTA if they have stones. The type 2 RTAs, the proximal RTAs, for whatever reason, don't tend to produce stones. Um, and I'll actually, it's not for whatever reason, it's for a very specific reason, because remember when we talked about, uh, the proximal RTA, we say that, well, they eventually get down to their set point. And once they're at their set point, that distal nephron is going to perform normally and they're going to be able to acidify their urine. Well, there's your key. If they can acidify their urine, they're not going to get calcium phosphate stones. Calcium phosphate stones depend on the alkalotic urine. In proximal RTA, once they get that bicarb down to 16 or 14 or whatever their TM for bicarbonate is, they're going to be kind of at that new set point. It's going to be bad for their bones. It's going to be bad for their metabolism. They'll have all this problems with metabolic acidosis, but they'll be able to acidify their urine normally and they won't get calcium phosphate stones. So the calcium phosphate stones are part of your type 1 or distal RTA. Okay, the 35-year-old with diabetes since age 12. Patient that's on uh, insulin and an ACE inhibitor, they're going to present with uh, hyperkalemia. That's one you're going to be thinking about a type 4 RTA. What's the intervention? Stop the ACE inhibitor, right? They got a little bit of metabolic acidosis. You stop the ACE inhibitor. Oh, and then uh, the patient who's got the non and got metabolic acidosis and that you give them bicarbonate and then their potassium drops. That's going to be your proximal RTA. Most importantly, when you see a non and get metabolic acidosis, don't go reaching for your urinary anion gap. Don't be looking at the UA. Do a GI review systems. Most likely, this is going to be diarrhea, way more common, at least in the wards than the RTAs, which are going to be a pretty rare disease. And and if they don't have and if they don't have a GI disease, then then we're calling you to figure out help us figure out their RTA. <laughs> no, and I think I, I think this is a totally appropriate time to use a consultant, right? These are rare diseases that people are not familiar with. You want to reach for a consultant. Here's a great time to use a consultant, right? Absolutely. Yeah. No one's gonna no one's gonna second guess that. Yeah. You know, it's helpful to do some of the workup, you know, make sure you check a urine analysis, make sure you got a, a urine light. Those are all helpful. We can try an answer quicker if you've already done that type of stuff. Uh, but yeah, this is totally appropriate use of a consultant. I, I love this topic. The The slides are great. And there's, you, you also have a video of kind of, it's like a video of you talking through the slides. That's, I think it's a couple years old now, but the, I mean, this is RTA stuff is like classic material. It's not like it's, not like it's changing hugely, except for sort of the fluid stuff we talked about a little bit from the recent trials. So this is this is really helpful. Excellent. Yeah, this is as close to understanding this as I've ever come. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, follow-up questions, you can direct them at Kidney Boy on Twitter, and we'll link to all the things we talked about in the show notes. 
And I think that's it for, for this episode. Hey, this has been fun. Thanks a lot. Thank you as always. Thank you. No uh, grandfather clock this time. I know. I. <laughs> so the wife is out of town, so the grandfather clock does not get wound. <laughs> <laughs> kind of miss it. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing mm. you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. <laughs> get our show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list to get our show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food. They're amazing. And we want your feedback, so send us an email to thecurbsiders at gmail.com. You can also reach out on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter at The Curbsiders. Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And by the way, we love your feedback. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. And I'm Dr. Stuart Kent Brigham. And good night. And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. And goodbye. <laughs> well, hi, Paul. And bye. Classic stuff. As always, I'd like to thank all of our producers who help make the show, as well as our social media team. Hannah R. Abrams runs our Twitter. Beth Garbs Garbatelli is on Instagram. And Chris Chumanchu is on Facebook. Thank you and good night. Good night. Good night.